to you a vessel unworthy and so scarred with sin but he did not despair he started over again and I bless the day he didn't throw We want to continue our messages from Proverbs. Proverbs is known as one of the books of wisdom. I see Tony, he's really looking intently at the screen and Joanne's trying to avoid it. <laughs> I knew Joanne would be crawling in her skin, but, and some of the rest of you may too, but the sermon title is truly one that is drawn from the passage of scriptures, life in the snake pit. You know, I don't know very much about my, my grandfather on my dad's side. He uh, passed away when my dad was only 13 years old. In fact, I only know one story about, uh, that my dad shared with, with me when I was a boy about his father, and, and it really was really more about him and his younger brother than it was about his dad. I know very little about my grandfather. Uh, I think uh, some of my other family members shared something with some of my other brothers, uh, my younger brothers later on, after my dad was gone. But my dad wouldn't, uh, and his brothers would not hardly speak of their father at all. From what I understand, uh, at one time he was run out of his uh, home state 
of Tennessee, East Tennessee, over uh, in Sevier County, which is over there where uh, Dollywood is now, because he was a bootlegger. And uh, I kind of think he might have got run out of Oklahoma too, which is where my dad was born before they moved uh, to southern Missouri. So I don't know a whole lot about him. I do know that uh, at least two of my dad's brothers were severe alcoholics. Uh, the older brother, uh, before, uh, before he passed away, a few years before he passed away, he gave his life to the Lord and quit drinking. But I remember as a boy when one of my dad's brothers would come and visit us on occasion and uh, the speech was stirred and he was not very steady on his feet and there's no telling what he might say. I know the struggle, uh, often he's in a number of accidents, in fact two in one day I remember. They come across uh, the radio one time and said, way to go, uh, Mr. Tilson says this is a number two today. Uh, I know what alcohol can do. I've seen it not only in family members, but I've seen it in others as a counselor and a pastor. I've seen homes destroyed. I've seen children uh, who didn't have enough food or clothing and it was because of the wastefulness. And by the way, even though the, the scripture today is, focuses on alcohol, the same can be said for any drug that alters the mind and the emotion and the heart of men and women, boys and girls. Life in the snake pit. Let's share some scriptures. And remember, this study is designed, God's word here is designed to make us wise. To help us wise up. And in Proverbs 20 and verse 1, it says, Wine is a mocker and beer a brawler. And whoever is led astray by them is not wise so if you want to be a fool then be led astray by alcohol or other drugs that would ruin you Abraham Lincoln is credited with this quote alcohol has many defenders but no defense in Proverbs 23, we probably find the Scripture's most lengthy discussion about alcohol. And listen to what it says. This will be up on your screen if you don't want to follow in the Scripture in your Bible. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaints? Who has needless bruises? Who has bloodshot eyes? Those who linger over wine, who go to sample bowls of mixed wine. Do not gaze at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly. In the end, it bites like a snake and poisons like a viper. Your eyes will see strange sights and your mind will imagine confusing things. You will be like one sleeping on the high seas, lying on top of the rigging. They hit me, you will say, but I'm not hurt. They beat me, but I don't feel it. When will I wake up so I can find another drink? Then in Proverbs 31, verses 4 and 5, it says, It is not for kings, O Lemuel, not for kings to drink wine, not for rulers to crave beer, lest they drink and forget what the law decrees and deprive all the oppressed of their rights. Give beer to those who are perishing, wine to those who are in anguish. 
Now these scriptures describe life in the snake pit. Now if you can imagine, I know Joanne can imagine, being in the snake pit. Just recently, I believe it was Christy was telling me, uh, Christy or Sherry, who wanted Christy, yeah. Christy was telling me that where her mother used to live. Now, of course, you remember, they used to have lots of animals there. And uh, I know hogs, for one, uh, usually kind of keep the snake population down some. But animals have a way of helping with that at times. But in the last year, the, the family that's moved in there, I understand, has killed 32 copperheads. That's a lot of snakes. That's life in a snake pit, buddy. And that just kind of makes me shiver and shimmy. But you know, we have, we have a snake loose in our community, in our world. And in fact, $600 million a year is spent advertising it. And billions, many billions, are spent consuming it. And it's all legal. Alcohol. But notice the specific command in Proverbs 23 and verse 31. Do not gaze at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly. Now this is a description of what occurs during fermentation. Yet many argue that Jesus was a winemaker because in John 2 verses 1 through 11 we read about his first miracle. He turned the water into wine. And so since Jesus turned the water into wine it must be okay, right? That's what they argue. But in the Old Testament the Hebrew word Tirosh is translated as wine or new wine in the English. And it always refers to non-intoxicating grape juice. But there's another word, yayin, in Hebrew, that is more generic. Sometimes it refers to fermented wine and sometimes to non-intoxicating grape juice. There's also a term... Oinos in the Greek, in the New Testament. And this term is sometimes referring to fermented wine and sometimes non-fermented wine or the grape juice. It's sort of like, for example, if I said, you know, uh, my throat's a little dry. Honey, would you go downstairs and get me a drink? Now, if she brought up a glass of wine or a bottle of beer or a, uh, as, as uh, some say vodka, they say vodka will leave you breathless. You know, it will. It'll flat kill you. You would be surprised, wouldn't you? But what if we were, I was sitting on a bar stool in a bar and I said, give me a drink. What would you expect them to bring? Something besides water or a Pepsi or Coke, wouldn't you? So we use, we use even those terms generically. And how do you know what you're talking about? Context. The same is true in the Scriptures when it talks about wine. You have to consider the context to be able to understand whether it is talking about fermented or non-fermented wine. Now I want to tell you, think about this. Just, just use your head a minute. Many argue that Jesus was a winemaker, so it must be okay. You remember he was at a wedding. A wedding reception. But how likely is it that Jesus would have contributed to drunkenness at that wedding reception? Would he not be going contrary to his own word against drunkenness? And they must not have been drinking wine that would cause drunkenness because 
the one who came to Jesus said, Hey, why did you save the best wine till last? Jesus wasn't contributing to a drunken party. Jesus made fresh grape juice. And that's what they had been drinking, grape juice. Or he would have been involved in a drunken party by that time. And so the wine Jesus made was not fermented wine. Now is there any God approved use for fermented wine or strong drink? Well, you might, after what I've said before, you might be surprised, but there is. In fact, we read to you, give beer to those who are perishing, wine to those who are in anguish. And the Apostle Paul told young Timothy, he said, stop drinking only water. Use a little wine because of your stomach and your frequent illnesses. Now, was Paul and was the writer in Proverbs, was the Lord giving us permission and promoting moderation in drinking or social drinking? Absolutely not. He was suggesting that Timothy use wine as a medicine. Much as it was used years ago in hospitals prior to more effective medications, for example, the relief of pain and suffering. Now the Bible warns us of the destructive nature of alcohol. And remember, before, ever, before anyone closes your minds, remember what it says. Those who allow wine and beer, that is liquors, alcohol, or other intoxicating items to lead us astray are what? Are not wise. Now if you want to be wise, then steer clear of them. Don't give yourself permission to partake of them. Because if you do, you're playing as a fool. The Bible warns of the destructive nature of alcohol. Some questions. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaints? Who has needless bruises? Who has bloodshot eyes? The writer answers that question. Those who linger over wine. And then he says, do not gaze at it when it is red. Why? Well, because it bites like a snake and poisons like a viper. Just a week or so ago, we were in Bible study on Wednesday night, and one of the prayer requests that we had was there was a child who had been bitten by a poisonous snake. Very dangerous. Dangerous situation. They were able to get that child to the proper medical care in time. But a dangerous, serious situation. You see, alcohol is a toxin. It's toxic to the body. That's why, you know, we use the term intoxicated. Because alcohol is a toxin. It impacts the physical body. It impacts various cells in the body, including brain cells. We know for sure, most everybody here probably understands the impact that it has on the liver. But the reason it does, in fact, why do people when they drink, why do they vomit? I guess because their stomach's smarter than their brain. They know it's a poison. It's a poison. It's toxic. And you know what? If you're a Christian, you know what the Bible says? Your body is the temple of the Lord. And we need to take care of our bodies as best we can. There are some things that, listen, we can't do anything about some of the things that happen to our bodies. 
Because we live in a fallen world that sin has impacted and affected. And there's certain things we can't do, no matter how careful we are. Some things are going to get hold of our bodies. But we have an obligation not to let something get hold of our body that is unnecessary. Stay out of the snake pit. And if you're in it, get out of it. Get out of it. Another thing we're told. It says your eyes will see strange sights. Some English translations, in fact, I believe that the King James says strange women. And the reason is because alcohol poisons not only the body, but it poisons our morality. It loosens our moral fiber. And you want things, you do things, you say things that if you weren't under the influence of this poison, you would not say or do or desire. Another thing we're told, your mind will imagine confusing things. You see, alcohol messes up clear thinking and good judgment. It in fact affects our minds. You will be like one sleeping on the high seas, lying on top of the rigging. Here we see the physical impairment that alcohol causes. We know how it slows down response in drivers. And listen, you say, well, al drinking alcohol is my business. Oh, is it? You say, well, preacher, why do you care whether, whether somebody else does alcohol or drugs? Well, I care, one, because I care for that person. But I also care for that person's friends and family or those in his neighborhood or her neighborhood. I, f I fear for what their children, if they have children, don't get because of it. I fear for the conflicts that that kind of substance causes in homes. I fear for those who have been, have you ever been driving down the highway and seen them going like this? I remember the first time that happened, I was just a kid. We were driving down a two-lane highway and my dad all of a sudden whips it off to the side of the road. He saw up ahead a drunk driver coming towards us, just going from one side of the ditch to the other. Fortunately, he was on the other side when he passed us by. But it might not have been that way. You see, not only the people who drink are impacted, but society is impacted by it as well. And it's not a good impact. For every dollar that the breweries contribute to society, it costs four dollars from taxpayers to pay for the problems that result. Physical impairment. They beat me, but I don't feel it. Here we see the unconscious wounds and injuries that happen. They don't feel the pain. And yet, and here's a beating that was, they didn't need to take. They cause problems that don't need to happen. Listen, I don't know about you, but I have enough trouble in this world. I have enough issues to deal with. I don't have to drink my way or drug my way into some other problem. And yet, when, I, when will I wake up so I can find another drink? Here we see 
that alcohol and drugs are addictive? What does that mean? They enslave us. There are folks who say, oh, I'm not an alcoholic, but you know what they do? They may not drink all week long, but they can't wait till they get the paycheck on Friday night, and I've seen them, and you have too. Maybe you've even been there. Carrying out a big old case of Budweiser, Coors, or something else. They have maybe out in the garage, they've got a, fr a cooler, and that's all that's in it. And they can't wait for the weekend because they're enslaved. They're enslaved. You see, there's the deception of wine because wine is a mocker. It's a mocker. Beer is a brawler. And whoever is led astray, one English version says, whoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Now listen. I know there's a lot of controversy even among many who say they are trusting Christ about, the, about alcohol. But I have simply shared with you what the Bible says about it. Now you can make up your mind and you can do whatever you're going to do. But if you're going to live like Jesus has directed you to live, you're going to have to get rid of the bottle and walk in the Spirit. You see, one of the things about walking in the Spirit, you can get, you can get drunk on the Spirit of God. You can become intoxicated, filled with the Spirit, as the Scripture says. But that won't hurt you. And that won't leave you bloodshot. And that won't leave you in sorrow. That won't tear up your home. It'll make it. It'll give you joy unspeakable and full of glory. Amen. Give you life everlasting. And I don't know about you, but that's what I want you to have. Not what alcohol gives. Not what drugs give. I want you to have the joy. Christ came for us to know and to share. Is that your life? Or are you willing to live life in the snake pit? And let me say something else before I close. You say, well, Pastor, I really believe that I have the freedom to drink in moderation. Well, I'm going to tell you something. There's folks in this congregation and probably every church in America who have an addiction to alcohol. And you're drinking They have overcome it because they trusted Jesus. But your drinking, even in moderation, could entice them to get addicted again. And you know what Jesus said? He said, if you cause the least of these to stumble, it would be better for you to have a millstone wrapped around your neck and you thrown off into the sea. You see, folks, you need to just quit thinking about yourselves. You better think about others. So even if you think you have the liberty, which I don't believe you should, but even if you think you do, what about the impact your drinking will have on someone else? What about your children? Do you know that at least one in, actually the, the figure is even more, 
But at least one in ten who drink will become a drunkard. And I've said this before, and I want you to think about it again. If I had a dog who bit one in ten of everyone who visited in my home, you'd say, Preacher, I think you better get rid of that dog. If you've got something in your life that's going to bite one in ten, one of those may be your kids. You better get rid of that drink. God help you to be wise. Because that snake has bitten multitudes. Multitudes. Get rid of it. Stay away. Say, God help me. God help me to be drunk on the Spirit of God and not on strong drink. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, dear Lord, for some, this is going to be a hard lesson. But it's one we need to learn. It's one we need to embrace. Perhaps alcohol is not the drug that is troubling some. But Father, may we not be enslaved by those things that destroy. But what may we commit ourselves as servants of the Most High God and be filled with His Spirit. Lord, I pray that as you speak to our hearts from your word today, may you let us know that these words are not meant to ruin us, but to right us. And we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. And smile, cause it's been a while. It's been like a whole day since I stopped so you could hold me. This child awaits, strong in the faith. Lord, you are the refuge that I just got to get to, so I won't let a day go, won't let a day go by without thanking you for the joy that you bring to my life. Sun shines on my face. It's a love so true, I can never get enough. You, this feeling can't be wrong. I'm about to get my version on. Take me away. It's a beautiful day. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. When trouble seems to rain on my dreams. It's not a big, not a big deal Let it wash all the bugs off my windshield Cause you're showing me In you I'm free And you're still the refuge That I just got to get to So I won't let a day go Won't let a day go by To put the drop top down Turn it up, I'm ready to fly And ooh, something about sing about there ain't no limitations your amazing grace your amazing grace and there's something about the way your sun shines on my face oh no i could never get enough of you